Well, you may be seated. You can turn in your Bibles to Psalm 130. Psalm 130. As you heard uh, prayed earlier, there's a wedding this weekend that uh, drew a few of our elders away, and uh, so uh, it's my privilege uh, this morning to preach the word, and it's my prayer just as, as we sung that we'd see uh, Christ together as we humbly uh, come before the Lord in his word. As you're going to Psalm 130, uh, Psalm 130 is uh, a psalm of ascent, as you see at the top, uh, the title there. And uh, the Psalms of Ascent are the, a group of psalms towards the end of uh, the book of Psalms, uh, Psalm 120 through 134. And these, these 15 psalms together are called the Psalms of Ascent. The, the most popular view of these, these psalms is that these psalms were sung uh, by the Jews on their three times a year pilgrimage uh, to Jerusalem, and it's a song of ascent uh, because Jerusalem is, is up on a hill, and that's where the temple is, and so from whatever angle you were coming from, north, south, east, or west, uh, you would be ascending the temple mount, um, and so it's a song of ascent. Uh, they ascend that mountain, and they would sing these to encourage one another and to remind themselves um, of uh, why they are coming to draw near to the Lord and how they might be able to draw near to the Lord. Um, so let's read Psalm 130 together as we take a look at this text here this morning. A song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning more than watchmen for the morning. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. This is the word of the Lord. Many of you know that uh, that. My wife and I um, have been facing significant trials over these last nine years or so um, with her health uh, going up and down and the struggles that we, we have faced. Um, there's been a lot of waiting. You know, nine years is, is a long time. And it can be difficult to find lasting Hope as you wait. Many of you have faced long trials, difficult, long trials in your life. And it's hard to wait, to trust the Lord and to find, to find hope in the midst of your trials. Well, the psalmist here models for us that we can find hope in the Lord. We can find hope as we, as we turn to him in the midst of our distress because of his character, because of who he is, because of what he does for his people, uh, even as we wait and wait and wait for, for him. He's modeling how to find hope in in trials. Uh, the psalm is broken up in, into four different stanzas, and each stanza takes up two, two verses as he progresses uh, through. 
uh, and ends with this, this invitation for all of Israel to find their hope in the Lord. So let's consider the path this psalmist takes and, and we can take um, as he models it for us uh, to finding hope as we, as we wait for the Lord. First, we turn to him. Second, here he models for us. We remember the forgiveness that God offers us. Third, uh, we wait. We wait for him to see what he will do, uh, and then we hope. Uh, we hope um, expectantly. So first, turn to the Lord for mercy in your distress. Look again at verse, at verse 1 and 2 there. He said, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. First, he, he turns to the Lord and he cries out to him. He cries out to them. Out of the depths I cry to you, he says. Uh, you can hear the, the tension and the anguish in his voice. Um, the depths uh, is often connected to uh, the, the deep waters, the depths of the ocean, the, the powerful chaos of the sea. Uh, the Israelites were not uh, known for being sea-bearing people. Um, they were agriculturalists. They were farmers. They were shepherds. Um, and they feared the waters, as you can imagine uh, in the times of old before a fuller understanding of, of, of the globe and a fuller understanding of uh, how to build better boats that can easily make it across the ocean. They feared it. Uh, and figuratively, the depths then would be this, this idea that you feel overwhelmed, overwhelmed by the, the thrashing chaos of, of life's trials and difficulties. In essence, he's saying, I'm drowning here. I'm drowning, Lord, in my trial. Psalms are, are, are helpful, aren't they, in that they... They communicate powerfully the human experience and human emotions as we go through uh, life's troubles. Um, hymns have done this for, for many people, right? I'm sure for you. Maybe, maybe you have a, a special song that has, has communicated something for you, put to words something that you couldn't say yourself um, that's been helpful for you, uh, either in times of, of, of joy and, and celebration or, or times of deep difficulty and troubles and, and sorrows. Um, I remember uh, the week before my grandpa passed away um, as he was, uh, his health was failing and his, he was wrestling with Alzheimer's and, and we got an opportunity, me and my wife and my boys, to, to go visit him and my grandmother and, and we sang together. We sang, great is thy faithfulness. We sang that today as a, as a church. Um, just a song that could communicate uh, that moment for, for us as a family. God is faithful. God is faithful. And being able to express those words. Well, the psalmist does the same here, right? This is the, the hymn book of God's people. Uh, have you ever felt like you were drowning in your troubles? Drowning in, in a trial, maybe even because of your own sin. Drowning in in, in the chaos of your own temptations and sin? Have you felt like your sorrows have overwhelmed you? Well, this is how the psalmist feels, and he puts it to words in this song. What does the psalmist do then with, with this feeling that he has? Well, he turns to the Lord, right? He's crying out to the Lord. Um, he doesn't bury this turmoil deep inside and, and hide it. Um, no, he turns to the Lord. He doesn't seek to, to drown it out with, with entertainment, you know, binge-watching YouTube <laughs> and just getting caught in that loop uh, for, for hours or, or, or Netflix or, or maybe drown it out with work. Some of us do that, right? Just get to the plow and just, let's just keep working. No, he turns to the Lord with that. He brings his, his sorrows and his distress to the Lord. I cry to you, O Lord, he says. And this is personal. He makes it personal. He makes it personal. This is, this is different than, say, an, an atheist 
who suddenly finds himself in a time of difficulty and, and, and finally cries out, if there is a God out there, would you do something? Uh, no, this is, this is personal for him. This is, this is the cry of a child who cries out to their father in heaven, right? Uh, the psalmist here uses the covenant name of God, Yahweh, wherever you see that all capitals, L-O-R-D, Lord, it's Yahweh. He, he's using the covenant name of God. God, I'm, I'm in a relationship with you. And so he speaks to God personally. He's not calling out to a God who may be or some powerful deity over there, out there. Um, he's crying out to, to a God he has a relationship with. Jesus taught us to pray this way, didn't he? Father, he said. Pray this way, Father. Um, turn to him in, in, in that sort of way. Well, not only does the psalmist cry out to the Lord, but he does so without putting on a facade. He doesn't clean himself up and try to speak properly to the Lord. He, he comes as he is, how he's feeling in this moment, how he is struggling. There's no false piety or, or pretense here. Right? He feels that the Lord may not be listening to him. Hear my voice, he says. Let your ears be attentive to my pleas, he says to the Lord. Of course, God hears him. This is how he feels. Have you ever felt that? God, are you even there? God, are you. Are you paying attention to more important things and I've, I'm off on the side? Are you listening? When you feel this way, did you know that you could say that to the Lord? You can communicate that, that to the Lord, that that's how you feel, and that's what uh, it seems like to you. The Psalms can give us helpful words to pray back to God, to say back to God uh, as these words are written for us. Um, the Lord isn't looking for platitudes in your prayers, Christian sayings and statements and uh, putting on a front, articulating ourselves, particularly uh, theologically. You know, you know, thou holy Lord art, and he's like all of a sudden we go into Shakespearean English and it's like, who are you? Um, is that how you talk to people? Is that how you order at a restaurant? I, it's, that's odd. Um, no, no, Jesus says, don't heap up empty words like the Gentiles do. Uh, and sometimes our, our theological phrases can just be empty words. Are we even meaning what we're saying? Is that how we really feel right now? We're, we're talking to the living God who knows our heart, who knows our, our very thoughts. We don't have to put on a show for him. Jesus taught us, you know, Speak to your father as a father who, who, who already knows what you're going through, who already knows your needs. You can tell the Lord. It feels as though he's not there or he's not listening. That's how, that's how it comes across to you, and that's how you, you feel. But of course, yeah, you know, hear me now. He, he does hear you. He does hear you uh, in your cries for mercy. And for, for us on this side of the cross, in Christ, uh, his ear is attentive to you. In Christ, you are welcomed to walk into the throne room of the living God and have his attention, have his focus, and have him listen. Let us then, Hebrews, right? Hebrews 4, 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can confidently approach him, the living God. And the, the confidence here isn't a, isn't a um, self-confidence. Uh, it's not, not a boldness because we think we're something and God ought to listen to us. No, in the context there is because we have a great high priest. We have Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of God, so we can enter the throne room in him 
as the children of God and have the ear of the Lord. It's the kind of confidence uh, that, a, that, a, that a child has to speak their mind, right? Just speak whatever's on their, on, on their mind, you know. Why is your belly so big? <laughs> you know, uh, I can't say that <laughs> to somebody in the grocery store, right? Um, but a kid has confidence, not because they're bold, and they're, but just this, they're just speaking their mind. They have that sort of confidence just to speak to people what comes to mind. You know, I would get punched in the gut for, for saying something like that. Um, no, it's that, it's that kind of boldness, right? It's this confidence before the Lord because we're his, we're his children. Um, so what is the psalmist asking for then as he, as he approaches the Lord? Well, mercy. Mercy from the Lord. Be attentive to my pleas for mercy. Mercy is, is giving, giving relief from some sort of misery uh, that uh, we may find ourselves in. Uh, that's why, that's what the psalmist is asking for, mercy. You know, for those of you uh, who are suffering, whether maybe a result of your own sin or the sin of others or simply because we live in a, a, a fallen and broken world, um, you can cry out to the Lord for mercy. You can ask him for, for, for relief from, from this misery. You know, sometimes I think we, we feel we're not supposed to ask for that. Oh, God is the sovereign God. He's designed for me to go through suffering. Uh, he has a purpose in this suffering. I can't ask him to, to take me out of it. Oh, the psalmist models here for us. Cry out to him for mercy. You can cry out to him and ask for, for mercy. Well, what gives the, the psalmist confidence then to walk into the throne room of God and ask for, for mercy? Uh, well, for, for any of us, when we're asking for mercy, we ask for mercy because we believe the person that we're asking has the power and authority to do something, to change, right? Um, at whatever level, you know, a criminal asking for mercy, they're, they're asking for, for mercy from a judge because they have the power and authority to lighten the sentence, right? Um, a beggar may, may ask for mercy, and they're going to ask for mercy to somebody they, they believe may be able to give some relief uh, to, their, to their suffering, you know. Students in here, you can ask for mercy from your teachers because they can lighten your load, right? You ask for mercy from those who have authority uh, to change something uh, for you. Well, we can ask for mercy from those uh, who have power to bring relief and so we ask God. We can ask God for mercy in our lives. But that, that's not the focus here of the psalmist. The psalmist is more focused uh, on the fact that uh, he's asking for mercy because he's confident in God's character, that he's the sort of God who grants mercy. He's the sort of God who has bountiful mercy, especially and particularly for his people. So he asks. So first, turn to the Lord. Second, remember that the Lord, Lord forgives. Look at, at the second stanza here, verse, verse 3. And, the, and this, is where, this is where prayer is designed to, to cause a change in you. Right? Prayer is designed to cause a change in you, not merely your circumstances. Um, but he's still praying here. The psalmist is still praying. And now he's, he, he prays talking about the Lord to to the Lord. And he starts with this rhetorical question in verse 3. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? If you, Lord, would keep a record, keep a record of my wrongs, who could stand before you? The implied answer is, well, well, no one. If for every person God kept that record of your wrongs, no one would be able to stand before the Lord and face his judgment without receiving judgment. No one could. 
iniquity is it's just it's another word for sin, but it has the idea of, of straying uh, from the right path, uh, a, a deviation from what is what is right, but also carries with it um, the guilt that is associated, the consequence of guilt that's associated with it. You've sinned, and you're guilty. Uh, if God would mark your iniquities, he says, who could stand? Well, the Bible tells us there's no one righteous. No, not, not one. There's none who seek after God. All have fallen, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans. This is the human predicament. Isn't it? This is the human predicament that the Bible over and over sets before its readers. God is holy. God is pure. God is perfect. And God is just. He doesn't overlook sin. He, he sees it, and he marks it. He knows it. And human beings, well, at the very beginning, we fell. We rebelled. And so you and I were unholy, impure, unrighteous, left on our own. And God won't simply wink at sin and just let things go by. No, he's, he's judge. He's judge, and he will give proper judgment because he's a perfect judge. This is what the Bible tells us. You know, the Bible tells us that well, God does keep a record of sin to humanity's detriment. And we will give an account. Jesus says in, in Matthew 12, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Every careless word we speak in our lives, we will give an account. The preacher in Ecclesia, Ecclesiology, Ecclesiology, Ecclesiastes, 12 says, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil, whether public sins, public deeds, or private deeds. Proverbs 21, too, says, a person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. He sees the heart. He knows what's going on in your thoughts and in your intentions. And he's the one who weighs those things. That's where we find ourselves as human beings. So who could stand? Well, the psalmist doesn't leave us there, right? But, he says, but that beautiful contrastive conjunction says, but there's more to the story. There's more to it, just like in Ephesians 2, right? You see, Yahweh is the sort of God that doesn't leave us in the misery of our sins. Look at verse 4. But with you, there is forgiveness. There's forgiveness. The way it says it here is that uh, there's forgiveness with you, with you. In essence, wherever the Lord is, so one of his companions that go with him is forgiveness. There's always forgiveness around with, with God. You have an opportunity to have your sins forgiven because of who he is and his character. Isn't this wonderful? He says, but with God, he's, he's a companion uh, with forgiveness. Forgiveness is a companion with him. And so you can turn to him and cry out, not just for mercy out of your misery, but for mercy for your sins. And this is what you and I have done in the person of Christ. You know, this, is, this is a statement about God's character, the kind of God that he is. Christian, the Lord took the record of your debt, of your sins, and nailed it on the cross, right? Colossians 2, 13 through 14. Many of you know this verse. 
And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. How? How can, how can a just God just look over our sins and forgive us our sins? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. It's at the cross. You and I have found forgiveness with God. So we can approach him in this way and know that though he has kept a record of every wrong I've ever done or ever said or ever thought or ever had motives in my heart, he's washed me clean. He's canceled that debt. He put it on the cross, and Jesus bore that penalty for me. But with you, he says, there's forgiveness. There's forgiveness. And praise God that there is because he's a God who sees everything and keeps an account of every single thing we've ever said, thought, or done. So praise the Lord that there is forgiveness. Now notice the psalmist gives a reason why. Gives, gives a reason why. Why does God forgive? Why does God forgive? Well, here's one reason why. That we would fear him. But with you there is forgiveness, he said, that you may be feared. That you may be feared. That we would worship him, revere him, be in awe of him, respect him, and honor him. The Lord, hear this, the Lord garners fear. The Lord seeks to create fear in the heart of his people by forgiving them. By forgiving them. Let's do a thought experiment for, for a moment. How do human beings in positions of power and authority strike fear in the people who are under them? How do humans do this? How do people do this? Think of a general. Think of a general who has, who has command over, over an army, a soldiers. How does he command respect of the soldiers when he finds one of his men has disregarded his, his rules? Well, with retribution, with punishment, I'll make an example of this man, and then you all will fear and respect me. That's what human beings do. People who desire the fear and respect of those under them garner that fear with a heavy hand. You will learn never to disrespect me again. Well, what does the Lord do? What does it say here? How does he garner the fear of his people? The Lord seeks to create the fear of him in you by extending forgiveness to you over and over and over again, and the list is long, and it keeps getting longer in my life of the thoughts and words and, and actions that I've done to offend the living God. And it's forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. He strikes fear in the heart of his people by offering forgiveness to them. That's astonishing. It's astonishing. You know, what, what, what about on, on our side then of, of that picture? That's what the Lord is seeking to do in the hearts of his people. How do we respond to that? Um, how do we stir up in our hearts the fear of the Lord? Uh, well, then we do that by remembering his forgiveness, by going to the cross over and over again, reminding ourselves, my sins are many, his mercy is more right? That's how we stir up an increasing affection for Christ, an increasing awe of who God is. We keep going back to the cross. Uh, and I have to say at this, at this point, you know, this promise of ongoing forgiveness are for those who are in a covenant relationship with God, those who've drawn near to God uh, in, the, in the way he, is, he has asked. Uh, for the psalmist, that would be, well, the song of ascent. They're, they're, they're going back to Jerusalem over and over again, three times 
a, a year, God has made a covenant with his people Israel. And if you were going to receive forgiveness from God over and over, you have to be one of his people, an Israelite going to the temple, receiving forgiveness from the Lord. Well, what about us? On this side of the cross, it's we go to Jesus. If you have come to Jesus Christ, you receive forgiveness. All your sins are covered. Every single last one of them because of what Jesus did on the cross. But if you don't come to Jesus, if you're, if you're here today and, and forgiveness sounds wonderful, but you, you haven't come to Jesus Christ, you haven't come to him and placed your faith and trust in him and saying, yes, yes, I've sinned. You've confessed before the Lord. This is who I am, God. This is who I am, and I cry out to you for mercy. Um, and, I, and I believe that, that Jesus died for my sins. He took my, my sins and put it on the cross. And I trust you. I trust you to take, take away that punishment. Well, he forgives you. If you don't, don't do that, then you don't have that forgiveness just readily there for you. And, and one day he will, I have to warn you, he will command fear of all. And if your sins haven't been forgiven uh, on that day in Christ, then on that day, yes, you will not be able to stand before him in judgment. Uh, but believer, you've been forgiven. You've, you've been forgiven. All your sins have been paid for. Well, the third stanza takes a shift from speaking to the Lord to speaking about the Lord. Um, so he's no longer praying these things directly to the Lord. Either he's speaking to him, himself or perhaps uh, the congregation. The, the fourth stanza will be to the congregation. So I kind of feel that this, this stanza is also to the congregation. So first we turn to the Lord, we remember his forgiveness, and then we wait. Wait for the Lord as you look to his word. Verse 5 I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word, I hope. Waiting for the Lord isn't simply um, just like buying time, you know, waiting for time to pass by, twiddling our thumbs or something. Um, there's, there's an eagerness in this. Um, you know, to wait for the Lord um, in the Hebrew is... Well, to wait, <laughs> to have to wait, uh, but with this expectation that, that something's coming, that something's coming. You're looking for something to happen. You're looking for the Lord to act. So you wait for the Lord. You know, it's, it's not like, like waiting for a package of printer paper to arrive from Amazon. Like, no, you, like two days ago, you, you, you clicked and then it was out of your mind. You, you just, you realized you were low on paper and you said, order, and, and you're not like out there looking out your window, like, oh, here's an Amazon truck. Oh, that's for my neighbor. You know, um, you, that, you're not doing that when you're waiting. Yes, you're waiting for the package to come but just because you're, you, you ordered it and you're expecting it to come, but you're not, you're not actively doing anything or waiting. It's not like that. You know, it's, it's, it's more like, you're a patient in the ER room and you're waiting for the doctor. Um, that's some eager waiting with expectation, right? Uh, you're looking for something to happen um, and you're trying to deal with the pain you're experiencing uh, and so you wait. The psalmist is waiting for the Lord to act out of his mercy. Um, and, and so this wait, waiting isn't inactive. It's active waiting uh, as we wait for his mercy. And the, the psalmist has been praying as part of his activity. He was, he's turned to the Lord and he's praying. Um, he's been remembering God's forgiveness, rehearsing God's forgiveness. Um, and then here in this section, he's, he's searching God's word. He's looking at, at what God says in his word. In his word, he says, I hope. I, I wait. In his word, I hope. He's searching the, the scriptures. 
The psalmist is waiting and expecting God to act precisely because what this has said about him, what God's word has said about the kind of God that he is. You can, you can wait expectantly, putting your hope in what the word says because you see and hear that God is your father and he loves you and he knows you. You can, you can wait with eagerness and, and anticipation, putting your hope in here because you see and hear that, that, well, Christ is my shepherd. He walks through this life with me. He, he's the one who's leading me in this dark valley He's my high priest, a sympathetic high priest who understands what, what trials are like and suffering is like. You see in the word that the spirit of God is in me. He's producing endurance in me. He's shaping me, molding me. This gives hope, right? So our, in, in our waiting, we don't just twiddle our thumbs. We go to God's word and we look, okay, God, what do you say about yourself? I can find hope in your word. We look there and we, we see things about him and we also see promises that he's made to us. God has made us promises in this life that we can, we can cling to. When you're waiting, you can know that God promises never to leave you or forsake you. He says that in his word, that he hasn't given up on you. He hasn't just moved on to somebody else. That, that not one minute of your life or this trial has been wasted because he has purpose in this trial for your good, to shape you, and for his glory. It's not wasted. That his love is always there for him. He hasn't stopped loving you, even when it doesn't feel like this is an expression of God's love, this trial that I'm going through. He promises that he'll cause you to endure to the end. So we, we, we can look here, right? We can hope in the word. Even as we wait, we're waiting. Our waiting isn't inactive. We look here at his word and expect uh, God to follow through on his promises. God to be the consistent God that he is, faithful to who he is and what he has said to us. Well, then he goes on and describes this waiting um, in verse 6. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. He's comparing his waiting to, to this, this picture of a watchman. We're, we're talking about the person designated for you know, the night shift, waiting in a watchtower, peering out into the darkness to be sure that the enemy doesn't attack the city in the middle of the night. You know, a watchman waits for the morning, he says. But he waits for the morning, how? What, what kind of waiting is that? Well, eagerly and expectantly, right? A watchman waits eagerly for the sun to rise. He's looking for it to happen. He longs for it to happen. Well, why? Well, one, because he's tired, and I mean, it's the night shift. It's long. He's like, come on, son, come back up. Um, he's, he's longing for it to happen. But, but more than that, because morning brings with it safety, right? Safety for the city. He's looking out to the night, hoping that they don't get attacked in the cover of darkness. Um, and so when the sun comes, ah, now everything's visible, uh, and the, the watching is less strenuous. He's eagerly looking for the sun to come. When will it come? But also expectantly, meaning he, he expects that it will come. He's not doubting that the sun is going to rise the next morning, you know, because he knows the sun is going to rise. Um, he's not unsure. He is certain that it will come precisely when it's meant to. Um, so it's expectant. He's confident that it will happen. Well, so the psalmist says, my waiting is like that. It's eager and expectant. 
I, I'm, I'm waiting for the Lord to act, and I'm eager for him to step in and do something in my misery as I cry out for mercy. I long for him to act. I know that he will act according to his word, according to what he has said he will do. I know he will um, in his timing, precisely when he means to. Um, and it might not look the way we expect it to. You know, we, we long, we long for, for mercy, and his mercy may not be removing the trial, removing the suffering from our life, but constantly producing endurance over time and over time, causing you to, to have to rely on, on, on the church, the people around you, to encourage you, to help you in your struggle. His mercy may become different than, than you expect it, but it's coming. So he, he waits eagerly and expectantly. So first, turn to the Lord in your distress, right? Remember his forgiveness, the richness of his forgiveness that he offers you, and then, and then wait, wait with hopeful expectation. And then lastly, hope. Hope in the Lord because of his unfailing love. You know, this, this final stanza here, these last two verses is now, I said, directed to the rest of the people of Israel. And it's an invitation to the rest of the congregation to find their hope in the Lord. You know, this, this after all, is a psalm that was to be sung by all of God's, God's people. And so he says, okay, Israel, as you sing this, hope. Put your hope in the Lord. Look at verse, verse 7. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. Plentiful redemption. You know, because of the psalmist's own personal wrestlings with his, his trials and his distress, uh, whatever that may be for him, um, he, he turns and invites others around him. You can find hope. You can find hope in the Lord that despite the, the bleakness of the circumstances around you, despite the ugliness of your own sin or its consequences, despite the hardship that you're facing, there's redemption and there's hope. Um, God will do precisely what he means to do in your trial. Um, why? why? Why hope in the Lord? Well, the psalmist gives two, two reasons here, right? Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. First, for the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. And second, with him is plentiful redemption. He gives two reasons why we ought to uh, be confident uh, and hope in the Lord in the face of our trials. And here again, he, he, he says it the same way he did with forgiveness. Steadfast love is with God. It's a companion with God. With the Lord, there is steadfast love as a companion. And, and with the Lord, there is plentiful redemption. Forgiveness, love, redemption are these close companions with God. Where the Lord is, these things are offered. If you approach him, that's what you're being, that's what you're being offered. The steadfast love of the Lord, the covenant-keeping love of the Lord, the kind of love that doesn't fail, the kind of love that's meant to be modeled in, in marriage, the kind of love that, that, that goes forever and is unflinching in the face of your trials. Uh, he loves you. Whether you feel like it in this moment or not, he loves you. Child of God, you're his child. Uh, he loves you. And let that bolster your confidence to have hope. You can, you can risk having hope in the face of your trials because he loves you. 
as his child. Um, he doesn't go back on his commitment to love. It's a steadfast love. Um, and his redemption is plentiful. You and I have, have received redemption, salvation in Jesus Christ. And redemption is, is, is more than just the forgiveness of our sin. It's, it's much more than that. Yes, we're, we're justified before the living God, but it's, it's also a promise of, of the final redemption. One day, these, these trials that you're facing and the sufferings that you're facing will be no more because of what Christ has done. Christ is seated on his throne, yes, now, but in the end, he will return and make all things right. There's a final redemption that is to come, and it's plentiful. It's plentiful. Uh, he is much of that for his people. So put your hope in God, he says. Hope in him, because he loves you, and he has plentiful redemption. Well, the psalmist ends by, by, by looking ahead with confidence, particularly for the people of Israel. He says at the very end in verse 8, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Um, don't know the context of, of where he, he is in this, in this moment. Some would say uh, a, a psalm like this is more uh, picturing the time of the exile where the people of Israel were exiled into, into Babylon and he's looking ahead saying, God's going to forgive us and redeem us and we will be able to get back to the promised land. Um, well, for us, these things were all fulfilled in Christ. How can, how can someone say that all our sins, all our iniquities, we will be redeemed from them and the result of them, the, the consequence of, of guilt because of our sin? Well, because of Jesus. Because of Jesus and what he has done. He is, after all, called Jesus. And Matthew says, for he will save his people from their sins. We needed Christ. We needed Christ for uh, the full and complete redemption that we, that we have. And we have it, the fulfillment of these things uh, in Jesus Christ. You and I can say all our iniquities are forgiven. We have been redeemed from all our sins, and we can praise the Lord for that. Well, some, some concluding statements here. You know, this, this life is, is difficult, you know, we're not promised a, a life apart from, from trials, apart from hardship. Um, and it can, it can feel like we're overcome, like we're um, in deep waters, uh, overwhelmed by the thrashings of life and uh, sorrows and, and pain. Would you turn to the Lord? Would you turn to him in your trials? and just be real with him, not put on a facade. You know, resist, resist cynicism. You know, when, when you're in a trial for a long time, it can become, does God hear me? I've been, I've been asking for mercy. Does God hear me? And we, we can become cynical and feel the temptation to, to stop turning to the Lord to ask for mercy. You could be real with him and talk to him about those things. You know, would, would you remember Jesus, his work on the cross, what we've been talking about? Uh, don't forget. Don't forget. In the midst of the storm, it could be easy to forget. The most important things have been dealt with. I've been made right with the living God. And I'm assured that even in the face of death, if this suffering ends in death, I'm forgiven. I can be with him for eternity. Uh, and these storms will pass in the end. Can you wait? Can you wait with that eager expectation while you, while you not just pass time, but clinging to what God has said about who he is and, and his promises, what he promises to be and to do for you? Cling to those things. If you're in a long time of waiting for the Lord to act in 
in mercy. Look to his character. He could be trusted. He's a God of steadfast love. He's, he's, he's worth your hope because, because he's a God who's full of steadfast love and redemption, plentiful redemption for you. You know, psalms, psalms like this can be a balm for those of us who, who are going through suffering, but it's also instructive for those of us who are walking beside those who uh, are going through suffering in this way. Um, do you have patience with them? Are you able to sit with somebody who's going through suffering and, and let them express how they actually feel and pray things like, God, are you even listening? Without saying, well, actually, <laughs> right away. Actually, God is omnipresent, so of course he hears you. Um, your theology is a little, you know, or, or, or can you walk beside somebody and, and just walk through this with them? Listen to how they're pleading, plead with God with them and point them to their shepherd, the only one uh, who, who offers forgiveness, mercy, grace uh, in these times of need. You know, we, we can find hope. We can find hope in the Lord as we turn to him in our distresses and, and we, we reflect on, on his character, who he is and what he's done for us, even as we have to wait for a long time. Amen? Amen. Well, let's, let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for your word. That your word is honest uh, about the human experience, God, that we don't need to pretend that suffering doesn't exist. We don't need to pretend that, uh, God, suffering rattles our faith and we struggle with hope. We thank you for the words of this psalmist and we, we pray that uh, for those among us who continue to need to wait for you to act, would you fill our hearts with hope? Would you fill our hearts uh, God, with uh, the fear of you because of your steadfast love and your offer of forgiveness. Father, for anyone in here who has not come to Christ, would you grant them faith? God, would you help them uh, to turn to Christ and, and see that uh, there's, there's forgiveness with you? God, these, these trials in life can be difficult. We thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen.